Good morning everyone and welcome to yet another session of the NPTEL course, The History of English Language and Literature. Today's lecture is a continuation of the previous lecture where we began to look at the spectacular contributions made by the prose writers to 18th century English literature. We also noted how this period laid the foundation to the beginning of novel and also to the various forms of experimentation in terms of prose writings. We ended the previous session looking, taking a look at Daniel Defoe who was to begin an entirely new kind of uh, writing in terms of prose literature in English. Today's session we continue to look at Jonathan Swift who was a contemporary of Daniel Defoe and also together they are considered as the forerunners of a special kind of satirical uh, prose which was also to later lay the foundations of uh, uh, novel writing in English. Swift was generally considered as the most powerful and original genius of the 18th century. He was a poet and a cleric, a rare combination of that and in that sense he was also because of his affiliation with the church, he was also a little more respected than Defoe but nevertheless he also was uh, the same kind of iconoclast as uh, Defoe was but his church affiliation prevented him from getting into further trouble at many points of time. He had a very peculiar kind of lineage, he was born in Ireland to English parents and this was a matter of concern uh, not just to him but also to his uh, fellow citizens for a very long time. He was generally considered as uh, Irish by many of his uh, colleagues and contemporaries but he continued to stress his uh, Englishness not just in, in his personal articulations but also in his writings and uh, uh, Swift also strongly believed that he was more English than anyone else. By 1689, he had uh, secured a position as the secretary uh, to Sir William Temple. This we had noted even when we were talking about Sir Temple's contribution in the previous uh, decade. This was also one of Swift's uh, steps towards political career which uh, he was quite ambitious about but however we do not find him making it really big in uh, politics in England. Uh, in, uh, in terms of his uh, the sites that he took uh, in terms of his political affiliations were also quite ambiguous. He was initially a supporter of the Whig side and later we find him swaying more towards the Tory side. He was enormously ambitious and we do find this getting reflected in some of the political treatises that he wrote. He also was idealist and he also uh, hoped to make uh, some kind of contribution and also radical changes uh, within uh, the English political scene though he, he did not get that kind of an opportunity uh, in England. Though he belonged to a different generation altogether, in some of his articulations critics do notice a certain uh, influence of the restoration period. Uh, because he did uh, display a lot of verbal violence, he used a lot of hyperbole in his writings. He also used expletives ex especially when he was uh, referring to anything uh, sexual and also there was a lot of excretory terms which found its way into his vocabulary. He uh, made a mark as a pamphleteer and as we noted in the previous session as well, the periodical essay was uh, quite a popular genre during those times. Uh, he also had a wonderful friendship with uh, Pope Addison and Steele and this also reflected in the kinds of collaborative work and also uh, in the ways in which they continue to influence each other and their writings. A particular uh, personal incident marked a radical shift in his temperament. Uh, there was this uh, Esther Johnson whom he fondly referred to as Stella whom he had met uh, in Sir uh, William Temple's office and uh, the nature of their relationship also remained ambiguous. However, he was uh, quite fond of Stella and her death in 1728 was uh, something quite tragic that happened and that had left a permanent mark on Swift's general temperament and we do not uh, find him recovering from that blow uh, even at a later point. Uh, his journal to Stella which was mostly of a personal nature, it was uh, the uh, result of this relationship that he had with Esther Johnson. He also went through a lot of uh, tragic things in his life. Uh, one of them was the mysterious uh, brain disease, the recurrent attack of which continued to bother him almost throughout his uh, career. And by 1736, it's also noted that he gradually and completely loses his uh, memory. This also had a very adverse effect on his uh, writing career and also on the general ways in which he was leading his life. The Augustan age or the age of Pope was generally celebrated as the age of flippant and shallow optimism. Maybe it was only at the surface level but nevertheless there was this uh, articulation of hope and optimism that most of the writers resorted to. In such an age Swift came as a very stark contrast and he exhibited only a profound pessimism throughout his personal bearings also uh, throughout his writings. And he initially uh, had published all his works under uh, different pseudonyms 
such as Lemuel Galiva, Isaac uh, Bickerstaff and M. P. Drapier and some of the works were also published anonymously but they were uh, of course accredited to him at a later point of time. So throughout his lifetime we do not find him using his original name in any of his published works. Now we begin to take a look at some of the more important works of Swift. Uh, he mostly wrote satires and also certain other kinds of works. His important satires included those which critiqued the government, the systems which were in place, a critique of society and mankind etc. Uh, one of these earlier works was titled Argument to prove that the abolishing of Christianity in England may be attended with some inconveniences. This was a scathing attack upon free thinkers and also upon the insincere professors of the current religion. So he being a cleric himself, he thought that it was his mission to try and reform the kind of uh, religious practices which were prevalent in England. He also thought that it was, it was very uh, important to expose the various kinds of uh, uh, corruption and superstitions which, were, which, ha which had found its way into the, uh, into the Anglican church even after uh, the turn of events which led to uh, the English Reformation. So, uh, he also became highly unpopular because of these uh, many expositions that he made. Uh, but his insiders view also gave a different kind of insight into his critiques. Some of his other works also include The Battle of the Books and A Tale of a Tub, both uh, published in 1704. These two works, The Battle of the Books and A Tale of a Tub, are also considered among the finest prose satires in English language. So, uh, if we look at the uh, content of both these works, we find that it, it continues to be quite uh, scathingly satirical. The Battle of the Books was about a controversy regarding the merits and uh, demerits of ancient and modern uh, literatures. Uh, Sir, William Temple was, uh, Sir William Temple was directly involved in this controversy, so uh, Swift took it upon himself as a defense of uh, uh, Temple's stance as well. In this work, we find Swift engaging more with his opponents than with the actual issue. Uh, nevertheless, uh, this, uh, the craft of it, the, the structure of it was so amazingly put together that it was uh, in the form of a great battle which uh, happened in the king's library between the rival horse. The structure of this was uh, uh, greatly amusing. Uh, it was in the form of a great battle in the king's library between the rival horse. In, in that sense, it also amused the people uh, uh, greatly. They also found this uh, newfound satirical structure quite uh, interesting. A uh, tale of a, a tub was based on ecclesiastical history, on church history and this was uh, the objective of this work was to champion the Protestant church against the pretensions of the uh, Church of Rome and also to expose the extravagances of uh, certain dissenting sects. At this uh, point, it is important to remember that even after the Protestant Reformation, there were many who thought that the English church was not completely reformed. So, there were a lot of dissenting sects who uh, proposed to begin new churches and new systems of uh, 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 worship in order to purify the church from its existing uh, corruptive tendencies. So, uh, Swift was not altogether a supporter of all of these uh, sorts of uh, uh, dissent and we also find that uh, though he wanted to expose the uh, corruptions of modern Christianity, he does not so show any tendency to break away from the institution of the established church. Some of his works also had severe consequences. For instance, the tale of a tub had greatly prejudiced Queen Anne against a Swift and so much so that it said that it even sabotaged the possibility of him becoming the uh, bishop at some point of time. Instead, he was uh, given the charge of St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin and soon after the Queen's death in 1713. This was not a position that Swift had looked uh, forward to. In fact, he uh, wrote about this to uh, one of his acquaintances that it was to die like a poisoned rat in a hole. Uh, it is also useful to remember at this point of time that though he was uh, born in Ireland he and though he was quite critical of the way in which the English were treating the Irish, uh, we do not find him taking uh, uh, much pleasure in continuing to live in uh, Dublin or in Ireland. We find him more English in uh, many of such choices that he uh, likes to make. Another important work was concerning uh, a proposal for correcting, improving and ascertaining the English tongue. This was uh, like a plea that he had put forward in 1712 uh, in order to uh, plead for the establishment of an English academy. And the Drapier's letters were had, uh, it was more like a political treatise. It critiqued the English policy of using a debased copper coin for its financial transactions. Uh, this was quite beneficial to the English, but uh, uh, it was not seen as a beneficial thing for the Irish. It uh, severely uh, damaged the Irish economy and also damaged uh, the Irish uh, trading profits. So, uh, Swift uh, takes it upon himself to write against this uh, uh, policy of using this debased copper coin uh, in the work titled The Drapier's Letters. 
Uh, through all of these works, Swift also uh, succeeded in making a lot of enemies, political enemies at uh, that and because of this we also find that though he was enormously ambitious to begin with, we do not find him, we do not find him making it really big in the political uh, scene in England. Perhaps the most important of his satires is a modest proposal for preventing the children of poor people from being a burden to their parents or country. It also is shortly known as a modest proposal. This is a continuation of the many concerns and grievances that he had uh, against the English for not treating the Irish well. And published in 1729, this also had raked a lot of controversy. Uh, this was written in a very savage satirical prose and it was a criticism of England's treatment of Ireland. He proposed that the starving Irish should sell their infants for food and this can also be seen as a good source of livelihood. This satire had provoked the sensibilities of both English and the Irish. Swift's argument was that this sort of selling of the infants uh, for food would also ease the burden on England and which uh, in any way, uh, in any case England was not doing much uh, for I Ireland or for the Irish uh, benefit. So this work was considered uh, supremely uh, provocative and also uh, uh, sort of double the enemies that Swift already had. Uh, but nevertheless, a modest proposal continues to be used in even in uh, contemporary political discussions to talk about certain uh, inhuman kind of uh, treatment inflicted upon different communities or different segments of the people. And it also talks about, it's also used euphemistically to refer to certain very uh, satirical attack on uh, the prevalent uh, governing systems. This now leads us to the masterpiece that uh, Swift produced, Gulliver's Travels. This was an enduringly popular uh, work of fiction. It was also of uh, bitter satire. So we begin to see the, uh, the contrasting nature of his works even in a work of fiction. This work, uh, Gulliver's Travels, it was erected on the foundations of misanthropy, but we, on the contrary, at a later point, we find that it also becomes a delightful children's uh, book enjoyed even by the adults. And this book is structured into four different parts. The voyage that uh, a certain uh, Gulliver, Lemuel Gulliver undertakes to different parts of the world which also, were which also had fantastic elements in store for him. Uh, so these four parts included uh, the voyage to Lilliput, voyage to Brobdingnag, the voyage to Laputa and finally the voyage to the country of the Hunims and the uh, Yahoos. So we find that he, uh, Swift had himself interestingly coined these fantastic places and also had given uh, fantastic descriptions and uh, uh, out of the world experiences to this uh, particular character who was traveling. And in the first one, the voyage to Lilliput, we find that uh, the uh, critique was mainly about the English politics of the time and we find him critiquing um, through a certain uh, allegorical representation of the voyages that uh, uh, Gulliver undertakes. Uh, we find him critiquing the infinite littleness and the absurd pretensions of man. And uh, similarly in uh, the voyage to Laputa, it's, uh, it's, uh, we find him launching out uh, into a very scornful attack of philosophers, uh, projectors and inventors of whom he had no high opinion. And he also th thought that the pursuit of visionary and fantastic thing was a, a very wasteful kind of pursuit. And in the, in the final series, uh, the voyage to the country of the uh, Huynims and Yahoos, we find a Swift talking about that animal called man who is sunk deep in degradation. And uh, he also is of the opinion that uh, man in general is a little better than a brute. So all of these depictions, it was directly aimed in critiquing the English society and the English uh, practices of those times. And it was not taken kindly by uh, many of his contemporaries and even at a later point of time this uh, sort of savage satire was considered uh, quite unacceptable at least for, for some time. But it's anyway a different story that at a later point it uh, continued to be um, uh, rated as one of the uh, most important and hugely popular texts uh, from the 18th century. It even led to a lot of adaptations even in the contemporary uh, period. Uh, it has been adapted into movies, into comic series books, into uh, different kinds of stage shows. So its popularity and its significance it continues to be unquestionable. Nevertheless, critics have had differing opinions and contesting opinions about his stature, uh, wondering whether to classify uh, Swift as a misanthrope or as an idealist. So this dividing opinion uh, was also based on the uh, contrasting nature of his personality and the, the kind of beliefs that he upheld. Uh, for instance, he was at the same time a Tory and a radical. Uh, he was a misogynist and also a supporter of the women's education. But nevertheless, whatever he did and whatever values that he professed, he was uh, infinitely moved by moral passion, which was uh, perhaps the one quality which uh, withstood the test of time and made him an enduring character to the posterity. 
uh, in, in one of the uh, earlier critics uh, who came after Swift, uh, William Thackeray, he was extremely critical of Swift's addiction and Swift's uh, imagery. He found it quite unacceptable. Uh, he talked about Swift as a monster gibbering uh, shrieks and gnashing imprecations against mankind, tearing down all shreds of modesty, past all sense of manliness and shame, filthy in word, filthy in thought, furious, raging obscene. So this was a critical opinion about Swift in the succeeding uh, centuries. And in the 18th and 19th century, there were also uh, critics who, uh, who tried to analyze his works in connection with his personal experiences and uh, opine that Swift perhaps was a lonely and uh, bitter man, disappointed by a world which had denied him success in church as well as in uh, politics. So we, we do not find him making uh, it really big either in the in, as part of the church establishment or in uh, English politics and perhaps this had left him an embittered man to talk about mankind in general with a lot of uh, uh, misanthropy. Having said that, one cannot entirely overlook the kind of fascinating th things that this uh, man did during his lifetime and even after his death. Uh, it said that Swift had prepared his epitaph well in advance and this is the same thing which is uh, placed near his tombstone. Uh, he dies on uh, 19 October 1745 and thus reads his epitaph. Here is laid the body of Jonathan Swift, doctor of sacred theology, teen of this cathedral church whose fierce indignation can no longer injure the heart. Go forth voyager and copy if you can this vigorous to the best of his ability, champion of liberty. So even at death, and even after his death, he continues to dare people, trying asking them to copy this uh, vigorous uh, championship of liberty that he upheld. Regardless of how he was considered by his contemporary and even uh, by his contemporaries and even the uh, critics who came soon after, he was greatly admired by Ruskin and uh, George Orwell at a later point of time. Uh, Edith Sitwell in the 20th century, particularly in uh, 1937, he even uh, produced a fictional biography of Swift uh, title, I Live Under a Black Sun. Let's also make a very quick comparison between uh, Daniel Defoe and Swift, both of them being uh, the perhaps the two most important figures of 18th century uh, in terms of the, uh, the, the foundations of a novel. Defoe and Swift, though they belong to the same generation, to the same century, uh, they perhaps only had one thing in common that they both uh, try to lay a foundation to the uh, prose writings in English and beyond that we find very little uh, in, in common that they share. Uh, it's very interesting to note that everything about them differ and in spite of that we find him together uh, contributing to the growth of uh, prose writings and also to the growth of uh, novel writing uh, in English literature. Uh, for instance, if we look at the major differences between them, Daniel Defoe was English. But on the other hand, Jonathan Swift had an Irish origin. Defoe's political affiliations were uh, quite uh, strong and he continues to remain a Whig supporter throughout and he was a liberal in that sense. Jonathan Swift, though he uh, shifts between two different political parties towards the end, he is a very strong supporter of the Tory party. He also remains conservative in his attitudes uh, throughout. Uh, Defoe was a dissenter. But uh, Swift, he remains quite loyal to the Anglican Church and in fact we see this in their writings as well. Um, Defoe supported dissent in multiple ways and he even argued for the cause of the dissenters. Uh, but Swift, we find that he remains uh, quite true to the Anglican Church and his problem was with those who were dissenting from the church and trying to uh, come up with other kinds of sects. Defoe, in spite of the many things that struck him in his personal life, he remained optimistic throughout. Swift was uh, starkly pessimistic and this also overshadowed the kind of writings both of them produced. Uh, Defoe, we find him exalting the use of reason, uh, keeping in tune with the enlightenment spirit of those times. Uh, but Swift, we find her, uh, him satirizing the use of uh, reason itself. He mocked uh, uh, those who pursued learning in a very different way. We we already noted how he never had any kind of uh, uh, praise for the ones uh, who went after the fantastic and ones who wanted uh, to make the world a better place through their visionary uh, innovations. Uh, Daniel Defoe was uh, the kind of person who championed individualism. Uh, but Swift, on the other hand, he condemned individualism of any form. He find him being a more uh, bound to the institutional segments, uh, uh, though we do also find him being an iconoclast in many different ways. This perhaps also talks about the 
uh, the contrasting kind of personality that uh, Jonathan Swift had largely. And in terms of their uh, novelistic production, uh, Daniel Defoe's work uh, uh, were mostly realistic because um, Robinson Crusoe is increasingly classified as one of the realist, earliest uh, realist novels. And significantly, we also noted in the previous session that many of his uh, fictional works, uh, Defoe also wanted to pass them off as, uh, as real life adventures. Though there was a lot of imagination built in, he did not want to present them as a fiction of his imagination. Uh, he was more an adherent of realism. Uh, on the other hand, uh, Jonathan Swift, he really enjoyed these imaginary uh, voyages that he uh, has written uh, much about. And uh, in a certain way, there is also a contradiction that we would find over here. Uh, though Swift was a very conservative person uh, in terms of his political affiliation and though he uh, was pessimistic throughout and though he satirized the use of reason, we find him also in the same level of default trying to uh, trying to use his imagination in its fullest uh, sense. And both of them, the one uh, thing that they perhaps shared much in common in terms of their personality and also in terms of their uh, you know, writings is that both of them uh, loved a flight of their imagination in the wings of satire. Moving on, if we also try to do a comparison between their fictional creations, uh, Robinson Crusoe and Lemuel Gulliver, uh, we also find uh, certain things in common and uh, a few things uh, which were which differentiate one from the other. So this sort of an analysis is also important because it also tells us about the kind of fictional creations of those times which reflected the spirit of the times as well. Uh, Crusoe was from the middle class. We find Gulliver also belonging to the middle class. Uh, Crusoe, in the, uh, as, the, as the novel implies, had travelled for transgression and also for money. But Gulliver's intention was only to uh, seek profit in, in a distant land. Uh, we find Crusoe primarily going to real places because he was, uh, uh, because the creator of Crusoe was also more like a realist. We find Gulliver undertaking a travel to fantastic locations because his creator was also uh, someone who liked the fantastic and the unreal and the imaginary more than the real places. We find the character Crusoe reacting positively to uh, the various circumstances that he is uh, placed in. But on the other hand, Gulliver finds himself quite displaced wherever he was. And uh, interestingly, uh, Crusoe also goes to uh, places where uh, perhaps he is not entirely out of place, also places where uh, he is the master of. But on the other hand, Gulliver finds himself placed in different sort of hierarchical uh, positions in all these voyages that he undertakes. And in Crusoe, we find a person who is trying to exalt the ideals of 18th century England. And there is also a lot of positivism and a lot of uh, um, optimism built into the character. On the other hand, Gulliver is used as a mask. That's how, may, uh, that's how most of the re uh, readers and the critics uh, felt after having uh, read uh, Gulliver's travels. Gulliver is uh, being used more like a mask in order to deliver scathing criticism of the uh, 18th century uh, England. So, uh, in terms of their representation of the 18th century England, both of them uh, do justice to their, uh, both of them do justice though in two differing ways through two different vantage points and through two different kinds of perspectives. Moving on, this is perhaps the most appropriate time also to talk about the interest in travel and travelogues in 18th century. Uh, travel and tourism was a big business and emerging pastime in the 18th century England. We find uh, people indulging not just in these distant uh, travels but also uh, in a form of domestic, to domestic tourism, um, visiting these uh, old medieval manor houses and palaces and also sharing a lot of interest in the uh, places of antiquity. During this time, it was considered that a grand uh, tour to distant lands was an, was an essential uh, part of education, uh, especially among the upper classes. Uh, we find that even during the medieval ages, there was this opinion that if one had not uh, made a visit to Italy, his education was not complete. That was the time of Italian humanism. And uh, with this increasing uh, colonial and uh, uh, related uh, expansive tendencies, we find that the upper class uh, English uh, uh, person also wanted to travel far and wide in order to enhance his uh, educational experiences. We also find them getting increasingly, increasingly interested in other cultures. Uh, for example, um, um, owing to the colonial expeditions to the uh, Far East, we find about 16 separate accounts of Mughal Empire getting produced in uh, English language within England by the end of the 17th century. The travelogue also accordingly emerges as one of the popular genres of those times. And there were also these set of people who were traveling for the sake of health. So, for instance, we find uh, this particular account, The Journeys of Celia Fins in 1697, which was uh, even before the beginning of the age of Pope, 
also the accounts of a certain Lady Muntik who uh, travelled to Turkey and uh, came up with this travelogue embassy letters in 1717. Many of the notable figures, many of the notable literary figures of those times also had undertaken a lot of travel. Uh, Addison had written about his travels to uh, Italy in a memoir and Dr. Johnson's trip to Wales also found its articulation in the ways in which he wrote. And uh, owing to all of these things, it's very possible to identify a very close link between travel, exploration, trade and colonialism. We do notice it in spite of the many things at the background in terms of uh, uh, literature, culture, art, trade, we find one thing which continues uh, quite unstaggeringly which, which is the growth of colonialism throughout the 18th century and also into the 19th and early uh, 20th century. With this fantastic note on the 18th century incredible interest in travel, we begin to wind up this lecture. In the next lecture, we shall continue to look at certain other important segments that laid the foundation to the, uh, to the succeeding age. And that's all we have for today's session. Thank you for listening and look forward to seeing you in the next session.